Welcome everyone. I'm just going to take 30 seconds for everyone to join in and get settled. Thank you so much for joining us today. We've got an exciting lineup for you. Um, my name is Alan Shapiro. I'm the director of Foresight's Waternext Network, and so I'll introduce that shortly. But this is the second of our industry matchmaking events supported by NRC IRAP, and so really excited for the mix of organizations we've got represented today, obviously on our um, consulting side and our water tech SME side, as well as we've got a bunch of NRC IRAP folks in the audience and excited to hear some of their perspectives as well. And then multiple provinces represented really a national event, which we're really grateful for um, with these events. That's exactly what we've been trying to do is just create these spaces around sector specific challenges to have conversations and hopefully build some connections too. Before we get started, I just want to acknowledge that I'm joining you today from the traditional unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil peoples in what is today Vancouver, Canada. And aside from acknowledging that in the context of this space that I live and work on, I think as water professionals, we've, we've got that added uh, responsibility recognizing that many of the water challenges we face in Canada are still around. First Nations drinking water, and I know some of the companies in the room today are working in that space. So here is our schedule for today. Um, I will do a bit of an introduction, hand it over to Zbigniew with NRC IRAP to do an introduction of that program. And then we will jump into our panel session with four fantastic panelists to chat um, for a little while about how they have screened and used water technologies for resource sector projects. And then we've got the rest of the event essentially for our matchmaking breakout session. So the idea is we'll turn it over, um, have a little bit more of an open conversation, give our technology uh, developers, providers an opportunity to introduce yourselves. And then we'll wrap it up with some closing remarks. So for the first half, we'll ask that everyone keeps um, your cameras, sorry, your microphones muted. If you have any questions for the panel, please throw them in the chat and feel free to introduce yourself. I see Astrid just throwing that in the chat as well. Would love to get a sense of the geography and organizations that we've got represented. Now, a quick intro for me. Foresight is Canada's clean tech accelerator. Um, Foresight supports the identification and validation of clean tech opportunities and commercialization of solutions. So this means working with our Helix 5 stakeholders, innovators, industry, investors, government, and academia to advance work on climate issues and green economy. And so part of that over the past year has been launching Foresight's Water Next initiative, which is the home for all things water technology and innovation. And that for us through Waternext has really meant providing that scaffolding or that fabric to support obviously Foresight's core programming. We're launching a Waternext accelerator next week for some of the early stage um, innovators who have exciting new technologies to commercialize, but also working with later stage companies through events like this, matchmaking, um, launching our community in a few months, and we'll have more information coming on that. And then all shapes and sizes of support, whether it's working with global affairs or around export focused programming or um, launching industry innovation challenges. So we've got a lot on the go. Feel free to reach out if you ever have questions about that. I'd love to hand it over to Zbigniew to do a little bit of an introduction around NRC IRA. Yeah, thank you. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Zbigniew Twardowski, and I am an industrial technology advisor with IRA Pacific as well as the uh, for today's meeting uh, the representative of IRAP national clean tech sector uh, that provides uh, enhanced services to uh, Canadian uh, clean tech uh, firms. Uh, about IRAP, uh, we uh, provide advice, connections and funding to help Canadian small and medium sized business businesses uh, to increase their innovation capacity and take their ideas to the market. 
What perhaps is less known is that IRAP also provides financial support to non-profit organizations that deliver specialized services to SMEs. Uh, and uh, here, since about 2016, we've had a very fruitful collaboration with Foresight Accelerator uh, uh, together, uh, that together with uh, IRAP Cleantech team uh, came up with a range of initiatives uh, all geared towards expediting commercializations commercialization of innovative clean tech technologies both in Canada and internationally. And up to now, the focus has been on water and wastewater sectors. Uh, from what I uh, figure, the present event continues this theme and in targeting specifically water, wastewater challenges in the energy and mining sectors. For this event, uh, Foresight has arranged for a group of knowledgeable expert panelists and SME participants that have developed technologies of potential interest to the aforementioned sectors. I am personally familiar with about half of the companies, including uh, one that is my client. On behalf of IRA, I wish all participants a productive and fruitful session today. Thank you very much. Thank you for that introduction and thank you for IRAP's support for our event series. This is event two of four in our matchmaking series and obviously we're continuing to grow and build that relationship with IRAP as well. So with that, enough introductions, let's turn it over to our panel and I'll introduce them briefly and then stop sharing my screen so we can see everyone's faces. Um, we will have a chance for our panelists to introduce themselves and speak to some of their work in a, in a second. So um, suffice to say, we've got an amazing panel with Ken Martins, VP and Global Practice Leader for the Industrial Water Group at Stantec, joining us from Nevada today. We've got um, Kevin Drake, Process Engineer with Solaris Management Consultants, based in Calgary. We've got Monique Samer, CEO and Principal Scientist at Maven Water and Environment. Monique, I'm actually not sure where you're based. Um, and Pat Leslie, Director of Technology and Innovation at Integrated Sustainability, also based in Calgary. So thank you everyone for joining us today. I'm gonna to adjust the view so I can see everyone and panelists go ahead and turn on your cameras so we can see you. And since Monique, I didn't know where you were based, perhaps you could kick it off and tell us where you're based, but also um, just take a few minutes to introduce yourself and the kinds of mining or energy sector water projects that your organization works on. Sure, all good, no worries. Um, I'm based out of Saskatoon, Saskatchewan. Um, we do work all over the Western Hemisphere though and a couple of projects uh, over uh, in, the, um, in Asia. But um, what we do, so Maven Water Environment, I founded a couple of years ago. It's my second company. My first company, I should also mention, founded back in 2010 was Contango Strategies. Um, that one, we had some great projects with IRAP also. I sold that in 2018 to a publicly traded company and it still exists under a different name, continuing on. At Maven, what we focus on is mostly mining water treatment. Uh, about 98% of our projects are in that and a little bit in oil sands. And we focus on modernizing and sustainable technologies. So passive and semi-passive water treatment is what they're sometimes called. Things that use the, um, biology, natural processes and systems, but uh, making sure that they have the same rigor and predictability as you'd expect from more traditional conventional approaches. Thank you so much, Monique. And I actually hadn't heard of Maven up until a few months ago and then they came recommended by one of our mining panelists from our last um, event. So really grateful to have you joining us. Well, if you're ever in Saskatoon, you should come see our facility. We just built out a multi-million dollar water treatment uh, laboratory, pilot facility, and technology development center. Would love to. And I know we've got a couple of folks joining us from Saskatoon as well. So extend that offer. Um, Ken, perhaps you'd like to jump in next with a short intro. Sure. Can you hear me OK? Yes, that's great. Yeah, great. Uh, so I'm Ken Martins. I'm with Stantec, uh, the global practice technology leader for the Industrial Water Group. Um, and I've worked both in, well, I've worked in pretty much most industries that exist. 
but is including energy and mining projects, which is what this um, get together has been focused on. And I've worked both in energy and mining since 1982. And so, um, anyways, by way of a couple examples, you had mentioned, you know, uh, that you, I think you want us to provide some examples in this intro. Uh, so, you know, for example, Santec has delivered a mining project in South America, uh, where we take a, developed a system to capture 20 to 40 MGD of city sewage. And we treated that to uh, augmented activated sludge process. It was augmented with well, primary fabrication, which is not unusual, but also with the trickling filter for BOD pretreatment, and then a sort of conventional activated sludge downstream of that. And, uh, and then it's further treated to UV and biological treatment processes in tailings ponds, because they, they do is they treat the water goes to their tailings and they drop from tailings for the metallurgical processes. So there's, there's additional treatment that goes on with that in tailings ponds. And we've, we've actually documented, it's been documented in terms of the beneficial impact that that's been for the metallurgical processes. Now, and I'll add that we're now conducting some studies and we've done some bench scale studies already of doing some uh, augmenting the treatment further. And we've documented some really terrific improvements in the metallurgical process in terms of uh, yields in the process. So pretty exciting stuff to be able to use uh, municipal wastewater for a mining application in an area that uh, water conservation is critical. On the energy sector, um, Santex delivered a project, um, a few, well, a number of projects, of course, um, you know, across conventional and conventional SAGD and oil sands. Uh, one project that uh, I did last year uh, was just really interesting in that it was such unique and extreme conditions. The, the wastewater in this case had about 15,000 part per million of dissolved silica. Yeah, you heard that right, 15,000 of dissolved silica, which is an amazing number. Uh, 70,000 ppm of TOC. And um, you know, the, the reason we could hold some silica in the, in the wastewater is because of a very high pH, you know, above 12 and a half, and temperature was around 220 Fahrenheit or like 105C or so. And um, and so we anyways, we developed a process bill to drop out that silica to get it down to a level under cooler temperatures that would be acceptable for deep well injection. And uh, so it's pretty extreme conditions, very interesting project. Uh, another one that I worked on while I was at the, another employer um, was a conventional upstream project. It's 120 um, million gallons a day groundwater flow. The groundwater was deep, very high TDS, about 150,000. Um, it had uh, high levels of dissolved iron, ammonia, hydrogen sulfide, and a lot of fine TSS, and it was also near boiling temperature. And treatment was provided, pumped, at, pumped up to grade at atmospheric pressure, but of course, covered tanks, capture fumes. We, we had to flash off, you know, uh, steam and, and the uh, sulfide. And then after treatment uh, for iron, ammonia, and fine TSS, you know, it's repumped at 3,000 PSI, transported 60 kilometers, and injected in a seabed. So it was, really, it was really cool about that project, you know, aside from just the size of it, is that every decision, every decision was at least a $20 million decision. <laughs> I mean, you want to change the kind of valves, right? Or the, you know, any kind of metallurgy, and everything was at least $20 million decision. So, it was really interesting working at, at that scale. So anyways, that's my intro. Thanks a lot. And really interesting range of projects. And I'm sure one of these days we'll pull you on to chat about other sectors um, as well, um, outside energy and mining too. Let's hand it over to Kevin Drake for a quick intro as well. Uh, thank you, Alan. My name's Kevin Drake. I'm a water treatment specialist working with Solaris MCI. They're based out of Vancouver. Solaris is uh, one of the largest organizations serving the energy industry upstream and midstream gas, LNG, and renewables. They've been in business in Vancouver since 1993. I've been with Solaris since uh, February of this year, and I'm working as a uh, senior process consultant, water treatment specialist, supporting them on all the projects. Um, and they're into midstream LNG plants, uh, mining projects. We're doing a lot of different uh, types of uh, work, uh, conventional work, boiler feed water treatment and replacement for different systems. And we're doing uh, uh, new plants and, uh, and old plant sort of upgrades and, uh, and uh, expansions that are requiring a, a new change in their water treatment inlet quality. 
My role is a water treatment specialist and subject matter expert, and I've been working uh, for 38 years. Uh, my career started off working with a technology supplier and as an applications engineer. So I spent about 10 to 15 years in that uh, domain. And uh, from 1997 forward, I've worked as a water treatment consultant and lead on a number of uh, oil sands uh, projects, both uh, surface mines and in situ steam assisted gravity drainage projects. Um, most of the plants have a water recovery aspect or a water treatment aspect to bring a, uh, produce water or emulsion and water uh, properties uh, back to boiler feed water. So reuse is a big uh, uh, design requirement and a big concern. And uh, I've been involved in terms of some novel practices that have uh, taken place in the industry, which is mainly converting from uh, conventional once through steam generator for steam generation, a very hulky and large consumer of water and energy uh, to drum boilers. And by doing that, the water treatment requirements had been shifted over from a conventional warm lime softening and ion exchange process to a thermal treatment or evaporator type treatment to provide that quality for steam uh, generators of that, of that nature. Um, I've worked a lot in uh, design and uh, uh, technology evaluations over the years, uh, starting with uh, my role back uh, early in my early years, and that's trans translated over to uh, running pilot technologies for my clients, as well as uh, bringing these pilot te technologies to commercialization where they've proved uh, worthy and uh, cost effective and, and, uh, and proven. Um, I'm currently residing in Calgary, and uh, uh, that's about it. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. And last but not least, Pat. Yeah, thanks, Alan. Uh, appreciate the opportunity to, to join the panel today. Lots of familiar names and uh, yeah, keen to meet some new people and uh, yeah, re touch base with some people who've uh, been a few years. Um, so yeah, my name is Pat Leslie. I'm the Director of Technology at Integrated Sustainability. I've been working um, at Integrated almost 10 years. So I was one of the first uh, four people at our company, uh, primarily focused on technology and, and technology selection for those 10 years. Um, since the start of our company, we've really focused, you know, specialist engineering, um, supporting clients through difficult, complex industrial water um, problems, a few of which were kind of mentioned by the other panelists. Um, you know, everybody in every location and every sector has different problems with water and that's kind of the nature of, of what we work with. Um, so I found it very, very interesting throughout the years, uh, you know, which sectors are, you know, we've moved into. I think um, we started in Calgary and we're primarily focused on oil and gas, working in uh, thermal and kind of SAG D areas and quickly realized that a lot of those skill sets really are really transferable and we're able to move into unconventional gas, uh, working through building large complex water hubs with you know pipelines, ponds for produced water, um, frack water recycling, um, lots of you know withdrawal river system withdrawals and um, and then in 2015 I had the opportunity to go and help start our Vancouver office and which is now, up and running and uh, happy to say successful. And I think we're working with a few of you on, on some projects. Um, it's been an, uh, a great journey and you know those transferable skills that we kind of developed in the oil and gas sector really worked well in mining as well. It's obviously very different and we're dealing with different contaminants and you need to have lots of specialists to help, but it's been interesting to see, you know, each time there's, you have to figure out what your, what, what's coming in and then really get narrowed in on what the downstream processes require in terms of water quality. And I think that's been a key that we work, a key aspect of our work in the years. Um, and then since then, we've been able to open up offices in Houston and Barbados along similar lines and, and you know, opening up to more municipal and agricultural, but predominantly industrial water treatment and infrastructure. And since, you know, becoming specialist engineers, we're now starting to own some of our own assets. So design, build, and ownership of assets, which has been a, a fun transition, especially, you know, working on behalf of clients to now selecting some of our own technologies and, and going through that process. Um, I think we've worked with, you know, 
probably seen hundreds of water technologies come through our door um, from all the different sectors and uh, have like really keen on you know some of the technologies and names I see here learning more about the who's here and what those technologies look like and talking more about how entrance to the industry really works. Um, so uh, I think as a project example, the most recent one um, I worked on was a technology commercialization for a large unconventional gas player, taking their kind of pilot technology and taking it through to full implementation at a gas plant, which included, you know, um, chemical, um, mechanical and, and filtration for recycling produced water. So, you know, we're up in that 10,000 cubes a day kind of area. And, and it was really important to select, you know, the proper technologies and really dive down deep into what the downstream processes need. So um, that's been a fun process. And, and since then, uh, we've been able to start taking a couple more technologies into that commercialization, taking them from bench or pilot scale up to you know full commercialization and integration into mining and in energy um, so that's that's a lot of the work i've done and i'm keen to yeah chat further on it and appreciate appreciate the opportunity to, to speak today thanks pat so we've got a few questions that we've pulled together um, for our panelists as well you're welcome as audience members to throw questions in the chat and if we don't get to those that'll be the opportunity to kick off discussion in our breakout rooms afterwards so obviously um, as panelists if you've got questions please hold on tight to those and you'll have the chance to ask them but our first question for the panel is what are some of the key water challenges that your resource sector clients are facing both at present and looking ahead at some of those trends so I know you've all spoken to elements of that, um, but if we can zoom out for a second, what are some of the challenges and opportunities that you've been seeing? And perhaps, Kevin, if you'd like to start us off with this one. I've got to unmute myself. Um, that's a good question. Um, just wrote a couple of notes down. Um, working in the industries and sectors that I've been involved with, uh, water resources become more and more in high demand and source water scarcity is, you know, sort of a general overriding sort of uh, requirement or the uh, demand that's uh, occurred in terms of developing and, and building water projects and designing systems. Uh, disposal costs and regulation requirements are happening more and more today. Uh, we're bringing, you know, the disposal requirements into play uh, from what was traditionally a bit more of a uh, a non-regulated uh, industry or resource sectors. Um, uh, uh, last and not least, uh, as, as with all water and wastewater projects, there's always the, uh, the, the um, what I call the balance between uh, searching for the right system, but also searching for the, uh, in, in essence, the lowest cost application to make it work. So you're often driven by technologies that do the right job. And as water specialists, we see creatively what can be done and how it works and, and what the, uh, uh, the byproducts are, the quality of the water that it achieves, uh, the certainty of, uh, of, of quality and treatment requirements. But at the end of the day, um, it has to be a consistent uh, sort of product and basically at uh, the lowest capital and operating cost uh, scenario. So in the wastewater arena, um, we see a lot of the disposal and cost requirements. And by that, uh, trucking uh, concentrated streams to offsite becomes a challenge because there's a high cost, there's a environmental demand or environmental uh, sort of hazard there. And so um, industries and, uh, and mining and, and energy facilities are uh, challenged with uh, trying to do better, uh, trying to meet uh, their requirements as a corporate uh, uh, entity, uh, the reputation, but also to do it right for themselves. So that's what I what I come up with that uh, required question. Thanks, Kevin. Much appreciated. And Monique, we'll hand it to you next. Okay. So obviously, I see a lot of opportunities because I founded a couple of businesses on this and see a lot of opportunity in this sector to grow in. Um, Overall, like if you're an entrepreneur looking or an existing business, right now this sector is booming. Ever since uh, things kind of calmed down with COVID around January of 2021 here, things just, uh, not that COVID calmed down there, but that's when we really saw a shift in the industry 
going from 2020, really um, putting pause on everything that wasn't essential into now um, a new cycle in the commodity sector and everything in mining end, ends up at some point revolving around water, either making sure you have enough, um, getting rid of the excess, and then making sure you're in compliance. And the compliance part is a big driver for uh, water treatment, and water management in the resources sector, because that can shut down an entire operation if you're not in compliance. So there is a driver, as, um, as was just noticed, noted before, about cost. Of course, everyone's looking to keep their costs down. But I've um, one of kind of the challenges, and I say opportunity with that, that I've seen lately, is that, um, well, at least in Canada and many other jurisdictions, mines need to have a closure plan in order to operate. They can't even begin to operate without that. And once they're operating, they need to update and revise this every couple of years in order to stay in compliance. And that requires for them to have a plan for what they're going to do with their water enclosure. And it's no longer deemed really socially acceptable to continue having electricity and chemicals and roadways opened forever in some of these locations where our mines are located. And so one of the challenges is how do you transition a mine off of uh, current active physical chemical treatment systems and onto a new program that matches with their closure. And how do you then, the next step, get that through permitting? And so right now we're seeing a challenge where there is a little bit of a lag between the state of technology in, um, in water treatment and the state of regulations and permits in water treatment, where um, there's a lot of innovation and new technology and technology examples happening. But then in terms of regulation, the challenge is a lot of uh, jurisdictions want to see it happen in their backyard. So for example, we've built constructed wetlands in the Yukon that have operated since 2014 at a mine or uh, a gravel bed bioreactor to have two of them that I designed and operate um, in Ontario right now uh, for mine water treatment coming off of a tailings pond. But until some other jurisdictions say, like BC says, but it's not BC, that's Ontario. And so there's this little bit of a lag right now in technology uptake, but we're, we are seeing that, um, that developing and um, coming along a little bit better. So I think that's really good. Um, I think everything else I talk about is opportunity rather than challenges. So, but I think that's one of the challenges. There's so much great technology development. We need to get the, the permitting and regulation to match up with it. Thanks, Monique. And uh, switch up the order a little bit. Pat, go ahead. Yeah, I think there's a lot we're kind of touched on by, by Kevin and Monique there, but uh, kind of back to what I was talking about previous, previously, the contaminants, um, actually narrowing down on what your problem is. I think that's a classic, you know, problem for our water clients and it persists today, not through just what the contaminants of concern are, but also I think the variability going forward, we're seeing, you know, um, different uh, aquifers and different uh, river systems with, you know, withdrawal limits that are affecting um, our client's ability to, you know, execute their work. And so finding technical solutions that, you know, take away the variability and, and kind of bring the problems into a manageable, controllable, um, within your kind of boundary limits, which is often, you know, the reuse of water, um, finding ways to kind of minimize your water and, and reduce your impact from variability from, you know, what the, how long the latest drought was and, and that kind of thing. And as well, you know, changing regulations to Monique's point around the technology. I think that's, it's a super, super important one. There's great technology out there. Um, but a lot of, there's both hesitancy from the regulation side and from some client side to getting those technologies out and piloted. There's been some really great kind of accelerators and labs that will test technology. And I think that's starting to really um, make some progress now to kind of solve some of those problems is, is really like, how do we go and vet this technology in order to take advantage of this? Because there's so many great technologies that have a very you know, narrow point where they have the highest value generation and being able to prove that and, and everybody, including the regulators and all the uh, producers and, and mining companies staying up to date with that is a huge challenge, but also a huge opportunity um, for value gain within, that, uh, within the water cycle and their processes. 
Thanks, Pat. And Ken, go ahead. Okay. I'm going to try to roll in some of the past the comments on this. You know, uh, Kevin mentioned water security. In fact, they, all three of the folks mentioned water security. Uh, in addition, you know, kind of along the lines of that, also we had the social license issues, which is kind of a new thing over the last decade. Um, and then a lot of those drive users have to use potentially degraded sources. Either it could be lower quality aquifers um, or it could be municipal water reuse, for example. And those definitely have impacts on, on our clients and how we, we use that. And then finally, there's also climate change related impacts, right? Because some areas become wetter and some become drier. So in the drier areas, a lot more reuse driven issues and the wetter areas, a lot more uh, potential run on issues and have to stormwater control. So really interesting uh, mix there. But the, the kind of the things that I think are really biggest issues are like fate of brine and salt. Right, because a lot of a lot of our clients are driven to maximize water reuse, and that drives up TDS. And what are you going to do with that brine, or if you drive it to salt? Um, there's from limited disposal options. Uh, I've said this of uh, some other groups in the past is you know I'd rather have radionuclides or pesticides versus salt because at least they decay. But if you drive, if you use like a crystallizer and drive your brine to salt, salt's always salt. 10 million years from now, it's still salt. So it's gonna outlive the landfill liner and it's gonna go to the groundwater and cause contamination issue. And at some point, our regulator community is gonna realize that and we're not gonna be allowed to dispose of salt landfills. And I really think the right fate of, of brine is to leave it as a liquid brine, concentrate as much as possible, deep well dispose that in a geologically stable, Formation. I think that's going to be the future on that. And then you know, that handling, you know, it drives a lot of high metallurgy, uh, high energy processes. So that drives up CapEx OpEx. So that's a big issue for the future is the need to the, the, have the fate of salt and brine. Um, there's the usual troublesome contaminants are still out there. Selenium is pretty common across a lot of industries for us. And at high flow rates, there, there's very limited option for selenate treatment. Um, and they're, they're pretty expensive. Um, now, tying in something what Monique mentioned is, is, is if we have to develop a mine closure plan, she's absolutely correct. That is what they asked. That's across North America. You have to develop a mine closure plan before you open the mine. And, and I, I really like Monique's focus on, um, on natural processes, passive processes. I think that's absolutely the right approach, particularly for a mine closure application. But here's, here's the, another twist, is there's these ever-tightening discharge regulations. And what that effectively does is it reduces the life of our plant designs. Now, if we're doing active treatment above ground, you can leave space to add new unit processes, et cetera, but it's harder to integrate a, a, a new plant unit process into a natural design because the size of the system is already you know, so substantial because of the real estate requirements for that. And if over the life of the mine, if the discharge regulation changes, like, you know, selenium gets even tighter than let's say less than five part per billion, then that makes, it could make what was intended to be done obsolete before the mine actually gets to do it, you know, 20 years later. So that's another issue is that we effectively reduce the life of plant designs because of the ever-changing, ever-tightening regulations. Another one, too, is this hiring and developing of, of skilled labor. A lot of our plants are really complex now, and we need some highly skilled labor. And actually finding some of that staff is a, is a huge issue, particularly in some remote areas where a lot of our energy producers are located or mines are located. So, you know, finding, hiring, developing skilled labor is a big deal. And kind of tied into that is this whole push of, artificial intelligence and machine learning uh, approaches to, um, to automation of our plants. Absolutely, that's also the way to go. Now, of course, the, the natural process, as I mentioned, is kind of avoids that uh, a lot, to, to a large extent at least. But for any active treatment, that's clearly part of that. And um, so that's another big challenge. And then the last thing, maybe it's not so much, you know, it could be for reuse applications, but PFOS, uh, peripheral, peripheral alkyl substances is becoming an issue that's obviously very widespread, right? I mean, all living creatures in, uh, in the world apparently can with PFOS already. 
And uh, so in the instances where we might have water reuse, particularly municipal wastewater reuse, PFOS is a good chance PFOS is in that. And therefore the reuse of that water becomes more complicated in some way, probably. At the very least, it may be complicated on the back end where we have to treat the wastewater for, for release. So that's another issue. Anyway, as I said, sorry to go so long winded. We'll have a chance to dive into the bus a little bit more. Our next November event will be focused on utilities and water supplies. And I think that'll be a big conversation point that comes up there. So one question, I'm gonna juggle our questions a little bit just to make sure we get to some of the good stuff too, which is obviously we've got a bunch of water tech SMEs in the room. And so we'd like to know, A, how do you find screen and select technologies as an engineering consulting firm? And then the B side to that question is, what is some of the advice that you can share with water tech um, companies? So both your own screening processes, and I know Pat, you've already mentioned that you've worked with companies in this room, and then by extension, what has worked for you and what is the advice that you can share based on that? Let's, um, Pat, if you wanna kick it off, go ahead. Sure, thanks. Um, yeah, definitely looked and uh, evaluated uh, quite a number of different technologies. I, I think it really depends on where your technology fits in the technology readiness scale. If you're if you're really early, um, I think it's super important to understand where your first highest value application is going to be and really be able to explain that well. So um, because a commercial client is going to be taking what they would deem, you know, a riskier bet on implementing a new technology. You really have to understand where your value adds. So I would say, like, be really, really targeted with, you know, what, how much value um, you're bringing in terms of like reduced capex, reduced opex. Um, you know, certain for, you know, your water is taking different contaminants out, and you understand in this sector that, you know, um, selenium or you know, silica are, the, are really the high value. I think understanding where your technology applies um, is super important, particularly from an economic perspective. If they're going to kind of risk a bet, they're going to want to have a really good economic payoff at the end of the day. Um, if you're more established and we work with, you know, both ends, I think having, um, you know, clear understanding of where you fit in the process and how you fit with the other technology that might be in that process and having a really, you know, strong resume and how you, you know, where you've done this and where you've done that. Because if you're, if it comes down to it, we're going to be picking companies that, you know, have had similar applications in similar industries. And because the water industry is so varied across, you know, sectors and geographic regions and industries, um, having, you know, relatable uh, experience is obviously super important. And so we'll look at that. Um, I think, you know, like having your technical claims like clear and present and, and you know, getting out there and, and meeting some people that are doing some of the implementation is key. Um, I want to have your technology in the back of my head when my client asks me a really complicated problem and to have that kind of on the tip of my tongue, even if it's just to like get out there and, and keep adding value to our clients. We want to understand where you think your technology fits best. And I think that goes, goes a long way in, in the selection process. And then obviously do technical bit evaluations and multi-criteria analysis to start figuring it out. But I think if you know your, your value prop really well, that goes, that goes a long way in the early stages. Thanks, Pat. Um, Ken? Okay. Uh, first of all, I think Pat nailed it really well. Um, knowing the value proposition is so critical because for new technologies, they got to demonstrate absolutely clear advantage over the old technology for them to get selected because there's a lot of risk that comes with uh, use of new technology. I think all of us would, would agree that none of our clients want to become serial number one, right? Because that's that you, you just know there's always going to be some pain that comes with that. So, you, you know, but you, if you could have some very so, so some very strong capex, uh, capex opex, or um, performance advantage, um, then then maybe you can entice and get the some of the buy off on on being that so I'm still number one. Stantec, you know, our approach would certainly be we would include a rigorous bench scale and pilot test requirements uh, for any new technology uh, adoption. 
um, just because we would want to protect our clients. And we would generally, you know, we would generally would argue that to, by do, doing a pilot unit, we can save money on the full scale because you can nail down uh, very precisely the, um, the uh, process sizing parameters that you otherwise might have to guess at a little bit or be a little conservative with if you don't do the piloting processes. So anyways, that's, that's more or less how we'd approach that. Thanks, Kim. And over to Kevin. Um, well, Pat and Ken mentioned a lot of things. And uh, when I'm working in the area of, of uh, water treatment uh, on a specific project, working with my clients, <clears throat> first and foremost, is there the will and, and the time to look at uh, what I call newer novel technologies? Oftentimes there is, and it's sort of incorporating what can we look into the future and uh, evaluate and study. But um, being a water treatment person who's been in design like all the others here on the panel uh, over the years, uh, you've got a good idea of what's working well in each industrial or resource sector and what's uh, conventionally uh, known and given out there. So the water treatment uh, technology providers, the vendors and, and the groups that are, are out there um, promoting and, uh, and, and putting out a good, uh, uh, a good technology pitch on something that's new and novel, uh, sometimes brings it into the equation of what they have, what they currently have in the marketplace and what they bring to the marketplace that is uh, sort of reaching out there and trying to uh, try something new, something that adds value or adds a, a performance quality uh, respect to what you're trying to do. Uh, selecting vendors is a really good thing because when you're uh, working um, uh, with all the tools and the processes available to you, it's really trying to find someone who's competent and, and many are, and have a very good stronghold on what they're uh, currently involved in the marketplace to help you in terms of putting together uh, a multi-unit operational plant where there may be one or two novel processes within the plant. So you're looking at redefining sort of the landscape of a plant and, and what technologies are used. Um, is it a unit operation that you're using? It has a specific narrow point that can provide value. Are you looking at a single vendor, sole source that provides the whole whole raft of equipment for a design? Uh, is it a partial design of a plant which may have two sole source vendors? And how do you work with these people to bring um, uh, what you provide for your client, in essence, being the pivot point and uh, looking at, you know, first of all, the design itself, how it works, how is it going to work for long term? If it was your plant, would you operate it? Would be something that you would select and why? And then does it meet the uh, both the, the life cycle costs, uh, capital and operating and maintenance and operability? But in essence, talking about technology providers, there's a lot of really good suppliers and technologies out there. We've had a chance to work with many of them over the years. And uh, you, you've got to find your opportunity where it has a solid fit. Does it require a pilot program as Ken and, uh, and Pat had alluded? And is a, is a pilot program going to give you the empirical data to give you more confidence and bring that to a commercial design? So all these things come together. I believe uh, technology providers are often partners that work hand in hand with us, uh, working with the client and working with the, uh, the contractors that are, are building the plant side by side with us. Thanks, Kevin. Really interesting to hear that range of perspectives. And for those of you who were here for our last event, really echoing what we heard from um, mining companies and um, oil and gas companies as well. Um, we'll kick off our breakout rooms in five minutes, and I'd be curious to get um, IRAP, IRAP folks take as well in those panel sessions about how they're working on the, the deep dive research and vetting um, and pilots around the technologies. Did I tr have like 30 seconds to answer that question too? I'm so sorry. I asked you on that one, Monique, so please go ahead. That's okay. I'll try to be quick here for the... No, we've got, we've got time, so no rush. Please please give I us your question. I think the guys did a great job answering a lot of that question. Um, so I'll try to take a little bit of a, a different perspective too on it, where what advice I give technology providers, um, especially new technology providers, given some of the focus of this and IRAP being here, is... Um, even though Maven does focus on passive and semi-passive and biological treatment, we're generally technology agnostic, meaning 
we will look and look at and consider all technologies on the table. And the reason for that is I have never seen a mine site where the water treatment challenges could be addressed by one single technology ever. Especially when you look at the multiple water sources on site and the lifespan of a mine. So it's really important to understand where your technology fits and how it interacts with other types of technology in there. As Ken mentioned before, um, a lot of times the needs at a site change. You know, your, your goal concentrations can change, your flows can change, the mining process and met circuit can change. So you really need to have some flexibility in what you're doing. It's also important that as you're vetting technologies or pitching a technology that you know what others are actually doing in that sector. So um, yes, AI, machine learning, all that is used on active treatment systems. But a lot of that actually also was done and even initiated in the selenium bioreactor sector a long time ago. And so if someone was pitching a, a biological treatment system without using IoT or AI, I'd be a little bit leery of it. <laughs> I would be wondering if someone was saying, oh, we're going to build you a constructed wetland. Oh, don't worry. We'll just check on it once in a while. And they don't actually have remote monitoring and sensing happening. I would be a little scared. So making sure that just because you've seen things done a certain way a decade or two ago doesn't mean that the technology hasn't changed and you need to really keep up to date with it and even some of like be aware of tools that are out there like as a vendor like the most modern BATs and, B and BATIAs that are out there so the best available technology assessments a lot of those are even five to ten years old uh, but you can at least use them as a starting point. So for example, the North American Metals Council, Selenium Working Group, which I'm a member of for over a decade, they issue um, updated guidance on technologies for selenium treatment, what has been used, what the CapEx, OpEx, all that kind of stuff, gallons per minute being done is, but you can then use your technology and compare it to there so that you have some discussion points that are relevant to who you're selling to. Um, the other thing is if you're a new technology vendor or technology vendor in general is understanding who would be the proper avenue to go to. So are you going to uh, try to pitch a large um, consulting firm like a Stantec or are you trying to pitch directly to the mines? And in most cases, you want to pitch to a consulting firm. In some cases, there are some, some mining groups that do have their own internal uh, R&D or new tech groups and those you'd pitch to directly. So understanding where who your client is and who you're trying to approach is really important too, because they're going to have different questions and different considerations. But I think more than anything, understanding how your technology fits in with other water treatment technologies is extremely important um, if you're going to be approaching anyone to try to incorporate it. Thank you so much, Monique, and apologies for missing you there. Um, great advice for companies, and I think that's maybe what we'll jump off from, from the panel to the um, breakout session. So thank you so much to all our panelists. Um, keeping advice for water tech companies in mind, we will jump into our breakout rooms. I'm just going to share my screen for a second to share those instructions. And then in those breakout sessions, it would be really nice to get an opportunity for our water tech SMEs and our NRCI wrap reps to introduce themselves to speak a little bit about the work you're doing. Obviously, recognizing we've got uh, we've got a good group of people here, so keeping those introductions fairly short, and then diving into the conversation. I've had a couple questions come up in the chat that I've encouraged folks to ask in the breakout rooms and. The goal of these sessions is really to come out of it with a sense of how are you as a water tech provider able to work better with consulting firms and then to make some connections and have some specific conversations around technologies as well. So what we'll do is we'll launch three breakout rooms, an energy room facilitated by myself and mining room facilitated by Foresight's VP technology, David Sanguinetti who's worked uh, for quite a while in the water um, treatment space as well. And then finally, we're gonna have a mixed energy and mining room that will be facilitated by Monique. So thank you Monique for that. You'll have an opportunity once you get into your room to jump between the three rooms. You can see the instructions on the screen there. You should be able to see breakout rooms in the bottom right corner of your Zoom window. And then you'll be able to click on that 
and select the room that you'd like to join. So um, feel free, obviously no pressure to stay in the room we put you in, but we'll start the conversations there. And if you'd like to jump from there, go ahead and do that. And then the last note I'd like to make is that we will be touching base with all the attendees afterwards to see if they're interested in their information being shared with other attendees and panelists. And so that means don't worry about sharing information and emails and that kind of thing in the breakout room. We'll send that information around afterwards to anyone who's comfortable so you can focus for the next uh, 35 minutes or so just on those conversations. So any questions about process before we jump into the breakout rooms? Ellen, just briefly, I, have, I don't have a link to the breakout rooms. I must have signed into some way and didn't work out. Uh, you'll just be placed there automatically. So okay, got it. As soon as as soon as we finish this, you'll be pulled into that. We'll get a little window that pops up on your screen, and you'll just accept the breakout room that you get pulled into. So with that, then let's jump into our breakout rooms. We'll be back here in thirty five minutes just to wrap things up. But for now, I'm really looking forward to those breakout conversations. Thanks, Astrid, for doing all the behind the scenes magic. Astrid and Lee, we've got a fantastic uh, track events team here. So makes life a lot easier for folks like David and I to just spend time talking. I wish, I wish that could have gone on for a lot longer than it did. We had some fantastic conversations in, in our room. So part of the hope, obviously, is that this does continue into other conversations. Um, for those of you just joining us, we're saying, I wish it could have lasted longer. It's hard enough to carve out 90 minutes in your day. So I'm really grateful for all of you for having joined us. Um, but likewise, we want this to be a jumping off point for more conversations. So as I mentioned, we will um, share contact info with folks after the event. We'll also share a recording with folks after the event. and. This is what we're hoping to do with our matchmaking events is just really create that space for those conversations. So um, we'll obviously keep you all looped in on our upcoming events, but likewise, if there's any feedback that you have or if there's anything you're looking for, please let us know. Um, I don't actually, Astrid, I don't think I need to share my screen again, really, aside from saying that um, we're so grateful to all of you for joining and I'd love, Zbigniew, if you wanna do a little wrap up on behalf of um, I wrap here if you're open to it. Um. Well, it's a surprise, uh, but uh, speaking for myself, I truly really enjoyed. Uh, actually, beat my expectations. Uh, uh, I was in a mining uh, uh, room, and uh, and I think there were very good points raised uh, by the uh, coordinator, by David, and uh, there was good uh, input uh, provided by other part participants. I think we need more of those uh, um, events in future. Uh, as I said uh, uh, at the onset, uh, I am with clean tech sector team. Uh, have been, you know, in all my seven years with IRAP. Uh, and, uh, but uh, I met at least, you know, half of the participants were companies not known to me. Yeah? So, uh, so uh, I, I think, I think uh, speaking personally, I broadened my, uh, my, my knowledge, you know, about the, uh, about the, uh, the sector, you know, so clean tech sector in Canada, and specifically in, in, in water and wastewater. So uh, thank you very much for um, coordinating this, uh, this event. And uh, I look forward towards uh, more of such sessions, you know, in future. Thanks again. Thank you, Zbigniew. Thank you to all of our panelists. Astrid shared a link in the chat to some upcoming foresight events and we will announce the date probably next week for our next matchmaking session, which will be focused on utilities sector and users. So stay tuned for that. That's in November. But otherwise, thank you all so much for joining us and um, enjoy the rest of your day.